So Chris is a math geek turned software engineer and data scientist. About a decade ago, uh, Closure graced Chris with uh, the miracle of simplicity. That's nice. And he has been passionate devotee ever since. He is currently uh, the research director at the Computational Democracy Project, a nonprofit which seeks to make governance a better reflection of the public we will by using data science and machine learning and closure to map out the and synthesize the opinion landscapes around complex issues, helping people better understand the other side. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I really appreciate everyone uh, participating in this in this conference. Um, this has been um, this has been a real honor for me uh, to be sharing the stage here, the virtual stage, with um, with Stephen Wolfram and with Gerald Sussman. Um, obviously, you know, both legends in programming uh, in computer science world, and um, in particular with uh, Stephen, was really fortunate that uh, as part of preparing for the conference, I got a chance to um, actually give him a demonstration of closure, um, which was pretty surreal having um, having had Mathematica as my first experience with a programming or computational language. And um, so really, really, really cool, really cool event this year to, to be able to be a part of. Um, so uh, thanks everyone for, for being here. Um, again, my talk is Scaling Deliberation with Data Science and Closure. So this story starts back in, uh, in 2010 with the Arab Spring. Around this time, uh, you saw across the Arab and, uh, and Muslim world, people rising up to demand change from their governments. Shortly thereafter, we saw the Occupy movements, um, which, which started here in the States and sort of trickled, trickled around elsewhere. And um, these were really about looking at the fallout from the financial collapse from just a few years earlier and how the big banks had gotten bailout, but main, uh, you know, Main Street America had sort of gotten sold down the river, or a lot of people felt that way at least. And so um, they, you know, there were there were protests organized to to demand that uh, that something change. So, a group of friends and I were looking at all of these, you know, this sort of turmoil and 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 seeing these movements, which were these sort of large leaderless movements, which were able to get people out into the street, but in many ways failed to achieve their, their ultimate ends. Um, and we sort of started asking the question, how can technology actually help people understand each other at scale? Um, and part of what we realized here is that the technology at the time was good enough to get everyone out in the streets and protesting but it was unable to bring coherence to the crowd, right? So Twitter and Facebook were able to get people there, but they weren't able to figure out like, what is it that they're all here for? What is it that we all want, right? Because in many cases, different people want different things. And finding, finding that middle ground that everyone can get around is, is extremely challenging. And these sort of vacuums of power provide opportunities for those who are organized and who, who do know what they, what they sort of clearly want to come in and, um, and take advantage of the situation. And this is something that we saw um, in particular um, with, with the Arab Spring. So our idea to this, at the time I had been, um, I was working at uh, Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center on uh, the computational biology department, uh, studying viral epidemiology and um, uh, the cross species um, transmission uh, of emergence of infectious disease, stuff which has, uh, of course, become sort of relevant lately. Um, but I I in the course of that job, I'd become familiar with a number of machine learning methods that we were applying towards, um, towards some of these and related problems and started wondering if we could use the same sort of techniques to solve this problem of helping people understand each other. Um, so the idea came around to use these techniques specifically to create something that we now call an opinion space. Um, or maybe I should say to create a model of what you might call the, the, the sort of true or latent opinion space uh, within, within a population of, of individuals. Uh, so th the start of this is uh, what we call dementia reduction. So if you think about, um, uh, if you think about a large number of people voting agree or disagree, yes or no, um, one zero, if you will, to um, a large set of comments um, submitted by other participants, 
you can think about every person's position in this landscape as being some point in a n dimensional space where n is the number of comments in, 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 this, um, in this discussion. Um, dimension reduction is a technique for taking data in a very high dimensional space and sort of compressing it down into a smaller dimensional space. And ideally in such a way that you preserve some amount of structure of the original space. Um, and where things get interesting with different methods is how much of that structure to preserve and how and, and what structure to preserve and um, um, and what degrees of freedom do you have in sort of creating this new space and, and what sort of patterns you show. Um, a very simple method for dimensional reduction is called principal components analysis, which you can think about as um, taking um, taking a set of points in a space and rotating it around until you're able to sort of create the biggest shadow in, in, in the projection that you're, that you're trying to find here. Um, so on the right here, we actually see um, all these little, um, all these little circles here, these the, are pro, profile icons uh, or pro, profile images, excuse me, avatars um, from individuals in a conversation and their positions here relative to each other are actually based on this dimension reduction. Um, so here really quickly, we get a sense of if two people are close together, they probably tend to agree, but if they're further apart, they tend to disagree. So already just by creating this space that we can actually visualize and kind of think about um, a little bit more intuitively, we're able to start to, to, to get some progress. I mean, our, our idea here was that by reflecting back to people, their position in the landscape and others, that we can start to build some understanding and, and solve some of these, some of these challenging problems. Um, the next sort of phase of what we had in mind for analyzing what we thought of as um, the opinion space uh, was to apply clustering to find opinion groups within the conversation. Um, and so specifically here, as a start anyway, um, and well, and still we use um, uh, the k-means algorithm, which is a very simple clustering algorithm, uh, which, um, which basically just tries to find these, these centroids, these centers of, of the clusters and cluster all the points around them. And Lloyd's algorithm is a sort of iterative step for moving those centers um, uh, closer and closer towards an optimal, an optimal solution. Um, so very simple to understand and, um, and, and easy to sort of interpret. Um, now by, by taking the results of these uh, analyses, we can start to visualize the landscape as I described, uh, but we can also use these opinion groups, these clusters to aggregate vote data and use those aggregations to start to figure out what comments were actually most reflective of each individual, um, of each individual group, as well as where is there actually unexpected, excuse me, unexpected consensus between groups. Um, so as an example of this here on the right, you can see that if you click on the group, um, this whole shape on the right, uh, this, this larger opinion group with 119 individuals in it. Once we click on that, we can see the statements that were important to that group. Um, again, as identified by these, these, uh, these, these opinion group based aggregations. Um, so this group in particular felt that, um, you know, during the campaign, they found out that 75% of minimum wage workers are 20, 20 or older. Um, I think it's the right thing to bring higher it comes to this group of people. Right, so this is something that really highly identified this group as, as being different from the other. Um, and if you look at these, um, these, uh, these bars uh, above the um, uh, overlaying the opinion groups, you can see how much more this group agreed with that comment than the other group. Um, so just by, just by clicking around and sort of exploring this interface, you're able to start to build up intuition for what people, uh, what people think and feel. So once we'd kind of come up with this idea and started, um, started working on, on an implementation, um, we decided that the best way to sort of move forward this project, which was starting to seem promising, we'd built a prototype and it was working and doing the thing. And um, uh, we decided to start a uh, for-profit startup to, to fund uh, the, the mission and vision that we were trying to accomplish. We thought that if we can, um, if we can find a market that this technology can be applied to, we can use the funding that we get from 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 um, uh, um, from seeing to that market to to further this this sort of mission that we had of um, you know affecting the way that people uh, make decisions together at kind of a broader scale. 
So this is where Clojure enters the picture. Um, again, we built sort of a prototype of this system um, with the math having been implemented in R, which was, a, you know, a, it's, a, it's a language that I'd used a lot at Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center and um, was, was great for this kind of prototyping phase of it where you just wanted to get something working and see if it, um, see if it did the thing but didn't really feel like the kind of language that we wanted to implement um, you know, a big system in. Um, it, even just simple things like reading in and out JSON just felt sort of much more challenging than with a lot of other languages. Um, you know, I, won't, I won't go into all the problems with R, but um, uh, as much as I love uh, you know, what, it's, what it's really good at. Um, but uh, I, I, was, I had recently started using Haskell um, a little bit um, as well as OCaml and was really taken by the functional approach to programming. So I started looking for, to see if there were functional programming languages that would be good in the sort of space that we were in. Um, so this is of course where, how I came across Clojure and some of the things that appealed, um, that appealed to me about it um, pretty, pretty quickly were the fact that it was on the JVM and that it had, it felt like it had so much potential in, you know, the big data space. And I, I put big data in, in scare quotes here because um, if you think back, or this is, you know, about 10 years ago now, um, data science wasn't really a common term then. Um, this was, it was still sort of a nascent, um, nascent thing. And, and really back then, big data was sort of the buzzword and all the rage. And Clojure had a number of different libraries um, from Storm to, um, summing bird to, um, you know, lots of different, lots of different tech organizations are starting to use closure to do kind of big data processing. And so it felt like a good, a good space to position ourselves. Um, it, we'd also considered languages like, uh, Scala, um, but ultimately decided on closure in large part because it just felt more cohesively and composably designed. Um, and, you know, I, I haven't, um, I haven't spent extensive time with Scala, so um, you know I know that a lot of people uh, really love it. But we just got this sense that it was trying to be too multi-paradigm. It's trying to be too a little bit of everything for everyone, and we really liked that. Closure just felt like it had made a bunch of decisions that all kind of worked well together, and um, and just felt like a really well-designed um, system uh, to build software with. Um, and the other thing that really attracted us to it um, were the superb concurrency primitives. And, and obviously, I, you know, Scala has, um, you know, plenty of strength in this area as well. Um, but this was something that really was a foundational aspect of Clojure's, Clojure's design. And so it felt like a, a strong point. language. So moving forward a little bit, we started this organization and, um, and we're beginning to, uh, you know, try to, try to um, explore different, different markets for the technology that we'd built when in 2014, the sunflower movement happened. Um, so this, this started with a rotten trade deal between Taiwan and mainland China, which almost the entire population was, uh, was against. Um, this was something that had been pushed through kind of by upper level bureaucrats and there had been, it had been sort of fast tracked through, you know, the standard political processes. And uh, it was made clear to the people that it didn't matter what they think this was gonna happen anyway. Um, so it, th this ended up being sort of the, you know, the, the, the straw that broke the camel's back and um, a large, largely student led, but also, you know, organizers from older generations set of protests uh, resulted in a peaceful occupation of, of the Taiwanese parliament. Um, so they, and when I say peaceful, to be clear, um, there was no destruction of property. Um, they actually cleaned up when they left. Um, just to contrast with some recent events, um, it was, uh, but, but part of what made it peaceful and part of what set the tone for, you know, this was, this was not something that was, again, destructive or, um, or, or, or malignant, was the fact that this civic tech organization called GovZero, um, typically written G0V, uh, had sort of come in and um, set up the kind of technological infrastructure that they needed to make sure that this, that this movement um, wouldn't, wouldn't go south. So specifically, they rolled out fiber optic cables out into the streets. They were setting up makeshift Wi-Fi antennas with Pringles cans, if I understand correctly. Um, I mean, it was just this really remarkable thing that all these people came out and made sure that 
there would be internet for people to collaborate um, and get, you know, get, um, uh, get help if needed. Um, and very importantly, that everything was able to be recorded and live streamed. So there was no opportunity for the media or, you know, other powers that be to come in and say, um, you know, oh, look at these violent, uh, you know, protests that are being destructive. Everything was above board and um, GovZero played a, a huge role in that. So much so that um, in, in sort of the aftermath of the people actually getting what they want and revoking this trade deal, um, the government was sort of in a moment of crisis. And um, they then digital minister Jacqueline Tsai, uh, if I understand correctly, actually came to a, a GovZero hackathon and asked them if they could build a platform um, for rational discussion and deliberation of policy issues that the entire nation could participate in. Um, so this was obviously a pretty bold request, um, but uh, it gave birth to uh, what, what is now known as V-Taiwan, uh, which is an adaptable process using many different tools, but uh, which uses Polis for the core understanding at scale component. So this process has now been used to deliberate and legislate issues on a national level. Um, and initially V-Taiwan was just about virtual, you know, the virtual space for V for virtual. So issues around, you know, digital, um, online, and um, in, in particular, some of the some of the issues which it was used to liberate um, were successful regulations of Uber, Airbnb, um, both of which have, of course, been challenges for um, for polities around the world to to sort of figure out how to deal with. Um, you have these huge organizations that are very powerful and you know found ways of sort of getting getting what they want. Um, but uh, with this with this process, they were able to come up with a solution that um, that really ended up being good for all sides. Um, and you were able to see that even even though there was a lot of contention around these issues, there were also points of common ground, and that those points of common ground could serve as anchors on which to build um, or foundations on which to build solutions for everyone. So this has gotten recently a lot of. Um, a lot of press. Uh, it, it took a little while, as you might imagine, right? When something happens on the other side of the world in, in Taiwan, it takes a little while, uh, while for it to filter down to the, to the English speaking world, uh, but eventually it did. Um, and so uh, s some, of the, some of the articles which have been um, published, which you can take a look at if you're interested in learning more, include the MIT Tech Review um, article titled, The Simple But Ingenious System Taiwan Uses to Crowdsource it laws, Its Laws. Wired uh, put out an article called Taiwan is making democracy work again. It's time we paid attention. Um, and, and very recently in The Atlantic um, did a wonderful piece called how to put out democracy's dumpster fire. So this, all of this has been absolutely amazing for us. I mean, I cannot tell you how insane and surreal it feels to, you know, a decade ago have started working on this crazy project, which just seems, you know, pie in the sky. To, uh, to having a nation actually make decisions using this technology and to start to get the kind of attention um, that, that the project has been doing now. Um, where things got a little challenging for us though was realizing that if we wanted to continue growing in the civic tech space, we needed to open source the software. Um, and the, the civic tech community was just not willing to, to go and take it other places um, without that. And so this led to some kind of immediate challenges. So how do we monetize an open source project? Um, the, the sort of natural answer to that was, well, we can do consulting, um, but uh, that, that leads to further challenges. How do we scale a consulting practice without taking VC? Um, if you're looking at a consulting business, you're looking at much higher dollar amounts than you know, software as a service. And so now your cost of acquisition of clients is higher and you get into this sort of cycle where without some kind of funding to push that project forward, um, you just kind of dead in the water. Uh, and you know, at this point we'd been working on this for, for many, many years and, and realized that you know, we didn't wanna take VC because we'd seen what happened to other organizations in the similar space who had gone that direction. Um, and so uh, it, a few years ago, 2018, uh, started the Computational Democracy Project um, with the goal of carrying out the mission and vision that Polis Technologies Inc. had started. Um, and just this last year, uh, we, we finally received official 501c3 charitable status from, from the IRS. So this has been, this has been again, just the conclusion of about a decade now of, um, of work on this project. And it's, um, it's fantastic to be able to share with you today that uh, 
that uh, both we have this organization and that it's, um, it's achieved uh, 501c3 status. But back to closure. Um, don't have a lot of time here, so you have to race through a little bit. But um, so this is supposed to be an experience report um, uh, of closure in, in, in data science usage. So some of the good, um, closure was obviously a joy to learn and work with. I wouldn't be here if that wasn't the case. Um, as a data-oriented language, you know, that it's just data philosophy really makes sense for data science. Um, that has just continued to be the case. Uh, it also has a really sharp and highly leverageable set of tools and libraries, which have been throughout a really, you know, a great, great experience to work with. Uh, and again, you know, the amazing concurrency primitives that are built into Clojure um, have been um, have been really valuable for us. So the sort of awesome potential, though, that I see for Clojure, and that we're you know we're starting to apply now, not necessarily to the core tool itself, but um, with um, with the kind of data analysis that we do with the data that we collect um, and, and th that others can potentially take advantage of from the data science um, closure community. We have closure script, which means that, you know, closure is really, as far as I'm concerned, the only um, sort of data science capable language um, that can do anything from big data to running a server to, um, you know, running machine learning algorithms um, that also has, uh, you know, a a viable and well-trod front-end target for building for building interactive clients in ClojureScript. Um, we've also now, as a community, largely converged on Vega and Vega Lite for um, for data visualizations. Um, so these are data visualization languages which are very philosophically compatible with the uh, closures. It's just data approach to things. Um, and there have been amazing advances in terms of the kinds of um, uh, numerical computing that we're able to do with Clojure. So um, Dragon's work on Neanderthal and Deep Diamond have been just absolutely amazing um, in terms of what we've been able to accomplish and making Clojure a really fast language for, uh, for, for implementing numerical methods um, and, and for doing, and for doing you know, deep neural networks. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, I don't want to say more recently. Now, similarly recently, um, we've now, I mean, Clojure has always been built on the idea of interop with, with the JVM and Clojure script. And this has also been, I think, something that really speaks to Clojure's potential as a language for data science. So we can interface with libpython CLJ to the, Py to the Python world and actually create two-way bindings where, you know, Clojure programs are able to call Python functions and Python programs are able to call Clojure functions. Um, Similarly with closures are we can we can interface with the R world if we need to implement things in that language, then uh, we can still take advantage of them from from closure as a glue for stitching things together. Um, and uh, as as we saw Stephen Wolfram demonstrate uh, yesterday, uh, we now have well we've had for a while, but we've now had some dusted off um, bindings to the Wolfram language, um, which which just opens up an entire world of really fantastic possibilities. Um, but I'd be remiss if I did not also share some of the ugly, some of the some of the challenges that we faced um, with uh, um, with this. So, first of all, ten years is a long time for any code base, um, even Closure. Uh, I mean, it has definitely been the case that I've found that a uh, Closure project from years ago is much more likely to fire up, uh, you know, down the road. Um, uh, without mucking around with things than, than basically any other language that I've worked with. Um, so this includes JavaScript and Python and uh, um, um, yeah, uh, and, you know, a number of others, but uh, Ruby certainly. Um, uh, but it's still the case that after 10 years, there's gonna be some stuff that's changed, even if it still works just in terms of what the community is using for different um, different tasks, different approaches to things. I mean, we've evolved a ton in 10 years. I mean, Clojure is only a little bit older than 10 years, right? So um, so there's a, lot, um, there's a lot that's changed in that time. Um, we've also had increased scaling demands. So um, we were able to get around some of the scaling issues of implementing these algorithms in Clojure um, prior to you know Neanderthal and, and Deep Diamond and such, by um, being kind of careful about the algorithms we chose, um, but um, for various reasons, you know, we're now starting to hit up on some of the some of the limits of the system that we've built. And some of the stuff is incidental, and you know, not necessarily at all Closure's fault, more my fault for you know having having implemented this stuff as my first my first experience using Closure. Um, 
uh, but but also, um, and this is kind of the, the third bullet point here is kind of in, in reference to the first, um, you know, moving away from core dot matrix to the tech ML stack um, is something that we'd really like to do to take advantage of all of this interoperability that um, that that it provides with with Python um, and uh, kind of the rest of the emerging closure ecosystem, which is really exciting. But more kind of to the point, um, there's a really difficult question which has arisen, which is as a nonprofit, um, we hope to be able to take advantage of volunteer efforts. So a lot of the work that it took to take this initially, you know, for-profit startup software as a service um, uh, uh, package and, um, and open source it, you know, that was sort of, it's easy to open source something. It's not easy to take something that was built to run on a single instance and make it so that anyone can go and fire it up to build that DevOps infrastructure to, um, to, to make it deployable and um, uh, you know, have repeatable process for, for getting things running. Um, and a lot of that has been driven by, by volunteer efforts. Uh, but um, a problem sort of emerges with, um, with respect to closure in that you know, closure is really a small community. Um, and so we ha as a nonprofit, we have to ask ourselves when we build a new piece of infrastructure or um, you know, some new part of the system, um, if it's not you know, already implemented in Clojure, is that how we want to implement it? Um, I mean, I personally would always like to implement something in Clojure over JavaScript or Python when I can, when it makes sense. Um, but uh, we also have to think about who's gonna maintain that. And again, as a, as a nonprofit organization, um, how can we make sure that, um, that, uh, that we can actually take advantage of the volunteer base we have available? So what I am, um, part, of my, part of my goal here in putting this talk together was to ask you as a community to, um, to help with this process of modernizing uh, the, the closure code base um, and um, you know, showing, that, showing that we as a community can punch above our weight and, um, and that uh, you know, this is largely for selfish reasons. I wanna use closure as much as possible in my work but I also think that there's a real opportunity for us here as a community uh, in that, that this is a really exciting project that's turning a lot of heads. And, um, and I think that it's, it's a wonderful showcase of the kind of cool stuff that, that closure can be applied towards. So uh, I'm going to end there, but I just wanna say again, thank you so much for having me. And um, sorry, I went a little bit over, um, but I'm excited to, uh, to chat further here and um, take questions and that sort of thing.